appreciate you all for coming. Cool. Can everyone hear me? I am so miked. All right. <laughs> I feel like I'm ready to do a Super Bowl show. Yes. All right. Um, so this talk is about um, the modern Linux server and um, containers. And really what I'm trying to do with this talk is decompose um, the technologies that make containers possible. Containers have been, um, A, a very uh, active point of discussion um, within the technical community recently, and B, completely misunderstood. So I thought if we um, kind of decompose the parts uh, that make it all possible, we might all gain a better understanding of what's actually going on under the hood and how it's useful. <coughs> um, so yeah, uh, let's just go back. So who I think you are as my audience um, are engineers who are wanting to learn a little bit about namespaces in the kernel and the low-level uh, pieces of technology like C groups that make containers possible. Um, and you possibly like turtles. So um, let's, let's kind of walk through what uh, the major pieces of this talk are going to be, and we'll dive right in. Um, the first is that we're going to do, do like a high-level system design overview, um, going from like virtualization, hypervisor virtualization, down to like application containers. Um, then we'll talk about namespaces, which are the fundamental piece of um, isolation technology in containers. And then we'll talk about C groups, which are, is like the accounting piece of containers. And then we'll look into some of the cool tools that you can use to introspect and build stuff. Um, so uh, let's just, this is a um, super like 10,000 foot diagram of um, how you can kind of think about this, these different types of virtualization and isolation of applications. So at the very top, you, like the heaviest weight thing that we have um, is a hypervisor. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with hypervisors, so we won't go into that too much. And then lighter weight is a container. And a container is like a virtual machine, only you have a shared kernel. So instead of emulating all the hardware, like a block device, CPU, et cetera, you um, have a shared kernel and you just launch from slash sbin in it. <clears throat> and then the, the lightest weight piece of isolation that we now get with all this namespace and cgroup stuff is um, what's called an application container. And um, there's a company in San Francisco called Pantheon that's been using these um, quite heavily. And so what they do is they actually isolate each um, PHP web worker for their, um, their huge Drupal hosting um, product. And they isolate each individual one so that it, it has an isolated environment, but um, it, it believes that it's in a full working machine. Um, so uh, we're going to look at a few diagrams. And I just want to give you a quick warning um, about two things. Uh, first, they're going to be a little dense, and second is they're hand-drawn because I got fed up with my vector diagramming tool. <laughs> so um, this is about the level of uh, skill that you're going to see. This is a turtle. And the, um, the thing is, is that uh, these are going to be really recursive, terrible drawings. So it's going to be like turtles on turtles. <laughs> and in some cases, it's going to get really bad later in the talk because there's going to be like a tree of turtles. And so, um, yeah, just bear with me. We'll try to get through this quickly. Um, so the system design. Uh, this, is, um, <laughs> this is a classic hypervisor diagram. It's classic because I know you've all thought of it. Uh, so it's hardware, Linux, and then uh, in this case, it's um, KVM is the, the um, hypervisor, sort of. And so you run a KVM process and then Linux inside. Okay? So you're running a full Linux kernel inside of a Linux kernel. So you got a stack of turtles going. Right? Um, so uh, what the hypervisor is providing is full hardware environment, block devices, Ethernet devices. That's what you're pushing into the hypervisor. And um, the guests are running a full kernel. So a container looks a little bit different. Like we uh, slice off one whole level of kernels and turtles. And uh, you end up with hardware, Linux, and then just regular processes that are containers. And inside of these containers is SBIN in it and the full stack. Um, that you'd expect. So you can, you can have your cron daemon running and your, your um, syslog daemon running all inside this container next to another container that has syslog and cron and all the usual stuff going. 
Um, so in this world, the host provides the kernel to you. You don't get an option. You're sharing the kernel with everybody else. Um, and instead of getting block devices and Ethernet devices, like actual Ethernet devices, you end up getting file systems and network interfaces, et cetera. They're already there for you. You don't have any device drivers. You just, when you come up, SPN in, it comes up. You're like, oh, I have roots already mounted for me. How convenient. Oh, I already have a network interface. This is, this is wonderful. And um, that's how it goes. You just start from SPN in it. And then finally, there's application isolation, which I mentioned Pantheon does and a lot of other companies do, where they use these same fundamental things that make containers possible. And instead of launching SBIN in it, they launch user bin PHP with a bunch of arguments. Um, and so this is a lot lighter weight because you don't end up having cron and syslog and all your other stuff running. You just have your application, but it's root running in a root file system. So um, instead of launching all those extra stuff that's eating up memory and CPU time, you're just launching PHP, or you're just launching that core piece of functionality you need. So that's um, what I'm calling an application container. And um, really a fundamental, a, a thing that's kind of made containers more complicated than it should be is we don't have good vocabulary around it yet. Um, so there's container, application container. Anyways, if you guys have better ideas, um, I'm sure the community at large would appreciate it. But um, So in the application container, it's just like the other one. The host provides the kernel. Um, you don't get, you, in most cases, you're not going to get a full Ethernet device anymore. You may just get like um, a file descriptor or something, but I'll describe that later. And um, it starts from your application, not in it. So the first big piece of technology that makes these LXC containers, these Linux containers possible is namespaces. <coughs> Um, and earlier today, I was having a really hard time uh, getting to Flickr.com for some reason they're down. So imagine a really cool, like medieval castle photo here. Um, this is, yeah, breathtaking, isn't it? <laughs> Perhaps the fog's rolling in. Yeah. Okay. Got you there. And so the, with that with that beautiful metaphor that I have on the screen here, what I'm thinking of is that um, namespaces are sort of like you know a castle. A medieval castle where you have um, you have the out, outside ring, which you know everyone's allowed access to, and then you kind of like create little compartments. So if like an attacking aggressor comes in, you you kind of have these isolated little pieces of the castle to protect people. <coughs> and um, so yeah, uh, the first piece of, of namespaces is hmm. Hmm. hey uh, Eric, do you have a clock or something? Because my clock never started. Okay, thanks. Um, so the first uh, piece is file systems. So obviously it's, it's like a truth. Um, if you've ever used a truth, um, the, the first piece to isolating something is you need it to not look like it's running on the same slash as the host environment. Um, so the file system namespaces are really important. Um, so the, the big pieces of namespacing of file systems that have happened over the last few years is um, it's a read-only uh, bind mount a shared bind mount, a slave bind mount, and a private bind mount. And these, building these tools together, you're able to give and build up a root file system for a container um, that is able to look at just particular pieces of the host file system. Um, the first really important one is obviously the read-only one. Um, and what, what this is used for in, say, Fedora, um, Fedora 19 has a bunch of container tools in it. And what they do is they actually um, give you the option of mounting slash user, which is where all the libraries and, and utilities and everything live in Fedora now, just slash user. And they allow you to bind mount that read only into your container. So now all of a sudden in your container in this isolated environment, just like a virtual machine, you have the exact same tools and utilities in your host for free inside of your container because you made a read only bind mount right in there. And so it's, it's like sh sharing the block device, like a read-only block device, um, which some virtual, thank you, thank you, um, which some um, hypervisors allow you to do, but it's really, really lightweight. And you're able to share stuff like the inode cache and all this stuff um, for free. Um, the next uh, piece is the private bind mount, um, which is pretty straightforward if you think about it. Um, what, what the private bind mount allows you to do is it allows you to say, um, I'm going to make 
bind these two subtrees together. But if I mount new things under this subtree, it doesn't appear under this subtree, and vice versa. If I mount things here, it doesn't appear over here. And so that, that allows you to create these sort of um, where you mount a piece of your file system into the container, but subsequent mounts under that bind don't show up just willy-nilly within your uh, other, other um, containers. So um, you'll see here that uh, I set up a regular bind mount, mount minus minus bind, and then I, uh, uh, in the source bind mount, I create a tempfs, and it doesn't show up under the target bind directory, and vice versa, I create a, um, in the target, I create a bind mount, and it doesn't show up in the source. So we've completely isolated the ability to bind or mount subtrees um, with these bind mounts. Um, the next piece is a shared bind mount. It's sort of the opposite of that. So everything's shared by default. And then um, the last is a slave bind mount where only the source is allowed to share things to the target instead of, and the target doesn't share anything back. Okay, so with these fundamental things, you're able to build a container um, file system. You're able to create a, a, sh a private, read-only mounted namespace and maybe optionally share things to it. Um, it may be user data or databases or that sort of thing. Yes? The POSIX, if you're running in the host, the... I don't think I quite follow what you're saying. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's true, yeah. <coughs> um, okay, so some co common patterns that come out of this functionality are things like um, mounting read-only user um, inside a container like I talked about Fedora doing, or um, giving a completely private temp um, directory to a container um, so services don't end up sharing temp at all, or um, like I said, sharing data across bind mounts. Um, the next piece of the puzzle is networking. So you've laid out a root file system, now how do you hook up networking into this thing? Um, there's a, essentially three different ways that in practice this all gets used together. Um, either you share the like, root namespace into the container, you set up a bridge so that the, uh, the container has a private network interface, but it gets bridged to the host network and then it gets usually natted out. Um, and if you need to expose some port like port 80, you set up IP tables to the bridge. Um, and finally, a private namespace, like completely isolated from a bridge or anything, and you use SOC activation, which I'll explain later, to um, actually get some sort of network file descriptor into the, into the um, service. Um, we can actually look at how that looks. That might be illustrative. Um, so, um, in the, so one of the um, container management tools that's uh, come out recently is called Docker. And um, what it uses, it, it, uses the, um, it uses the bridge method of, of sharing. So um, if I get in here, Those on a demo. Okay, so um, inside the container, oops, inside the container we have an F0 like you'd expect from like a virtual machine or a regular machine, and um, it's set up uh, at .o, .2, and then um, outside the container, uh, it shows up as this veth, some random numbers. Um, device, and if you run, um, and if you if you look at the bridge that uh, it's set up to, so you can think of a bridge as like a, a level two switch or something. Um, something you see that that's a connected to a bridge that then routes you to the internet. Um, so uh, yeah, you have a private network namespace, but it, it's given access via sort of a, a bridge. Um, so yeah, uh, and then the other way of doing it is the root namespace uh, where essentially you just are given access to all the devices. 
Um, so like by default, inspawn gives you access, uh, inspawns another container thing that's connected to system D that allows you to run sort of a machine container. And they, they just give you full access to the host ethernet devices. So if you wanna bind to port 80 or whatever, you can. Um, so the advantages of the root namespace is that it's really, really fast. It's easy to get set up because you don't have to set up bridging or anything. Um, all the network looks normal to the container. It's not fancy. There's no socket activation or anything. Um, the disadvantages are that there's no like separation of concerns. You can just turn on and off um, the Ethernet devices, change the MAC addresses, et cetera, um, and the container is like in full control, essentially. Um, and comparing that to network bridges, um, oops, sorry. Uh, the advantage is, is it, uh, the advantage is it's more complex to set up. Hmm. Hmm. That's oftentimes not the case. Uh, <laughs> so the network looks normal to the container, and um, the disadvantage is, is that it's more complex to get set up. Um, you get less speed because you're going through a bridge. Um, you're possibly nodding to the internet, which we can make configuring some services a lot more complicated. Um, uh, yeah, Hadoop and stuff do not enjoy being natted, for example. And um, you need to use IP tables to expose to a public socket. So you can't just por open port 80 and then suddenly get um, Nginx traffic. Um, you need to set up IP tables via the bridge to your container. Um, and the, the piece of sort of innovation that's come out of system D is a thing called socket activation. Um, and what socket activation is, who's familiar with INET D and like INET D sort of style services? So um, what socket activation allows you to do is do INET D style startup of services. So when somebody connects to a port, um, a process is started. But the difference is, is that the, um, the, you don't need to start the process for every single client that connects to that port. So system D starts it and hands off the socket to you before it actually accepts the connection. And so you're then in charge of managing the connections after that. Um, so socket activation kind of gives you the advantage of the INET D like startup style. Um, and you're able to fully isolate yourself from the network because you're not listening on anything. You're only accepting this file descriptor when you get started up. Um, and there's a little protocol where essentially they open a file descriptor for you and via some environment variables tell you, hey, you have a file descriptor here um, that you were expecting. I hope you know what to do with it. Um, so socket <laughs> So socket activation, um, the advantage is, is there's no network interfaces for you to listen on, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, sockets are passed in um, either via standard in, like I was mentioning, INET D style, or via the new system D style. Um, so I guess I've walked through this. I always get ahead of myself. So here are the um, bullet points if you're interested in bullet points. Um, and then, uh, Sort of the last piece of the puzzle is the process namespace. So um, if I'm inside of my container, um, what the process namespace allows me to do is when I run ps aux, um, I see, you know, I see PID1 is bin shell, and outside the container, if I run ps aux, uh, that is not the case. So um, that's sort of the major use case there um, of the namespace. And then obviously there's a ton of other pieces that you need to virtualize and, and namespace within the kernel um, that aren't uh, famous enough or in the front of anybody's mind to like get mentioned here, but they are like uh, UTS name, uh, Unix style IPC, um, and, and lots of lots of other stuff. But I'm just punting because going through all of it is just a lot of work and file systems and networking is mostly what we think about. So um, I appreciate all the work of the engineers, if any of them are in the room but um, it's just a lot of stuff. Okay, so namespaces allow us to get, um, get isolation. They allow us to kind of fence off, create those castle walls that you all remember. Um, and uh, what C groups allow us to do is um, they kind of allow us to create accounting. So we're, we're able to, well, why don't we just turn to another photo? So imagine, Imagine an accountant's desk overflowing with paperwork. His hands are on his head in, in despair, which is misspelled. And 
Um, and so what, what C groups allow us to do is they, they're like the accountant. They, they track all these metrics that are happening on the machine inside the container, not necessarily just containers, but it, C groups map to the, essentially the process namespace. Um, but they, they allow us to, um, the kernel, to track all these things that are happening in the process namespace. And then um, in some cases, put limits on what can happen. So um, I can say things like, I only want um, you know, the C, this set of process, this subtree of the, of the process tree to um, only run for 25% you know, of the time, those sorts of things. So um, it's, in, it, it's able to give you some control over uh, essentially nicing the processes in, in various metrics. So uh, yeah, block IO is um, obviously a big one. Um, and so the C group for block IO allows you to do essentially weights from, I don't know who selected these, but from 10 to 1,000, and the default I think is 1,000. Um, and then also you're able to do arbitrary bandwidth limits. And so you can say, I only want five megabits per second on this device to this process group or um, read or write or whatever. So it's, it's very high level functionality that it allows you to do. And then out of the C group, you get um, all sorts of metrics. Probably the most important ones for most of us are gonna be like uh, the IOPS that are serviced and the IOPS that are waiting and queued, that sort of thing. Um, the next major C group uh, is CPU. So um, the CPU has very similar to the, um, to the waiting system in the block IO, the CPU has a share system and the default is 1024 and it allows you to say, uh, the default's 1024 if I wanna give twice as many share, and it's like, as far as I can tell, it's like, uh, it's like shares in a company or something. So. Um, so like if you wait something in 2048 and it gets twice as much as 1024 subtree. Um, and then there's a bunch of useful metrics that come on off of this C group. Uh, uh, and probably the most, well there are actually not that many metrics off the CPU group, but um, for a subtree of processes, you're able to get the user and system time that was spent there. <coughs> um, and then the last uh, sort of major C group that's um, used is uh, the memory C group. And um, you're able to limit the total amount of memory. That mm, you're able to limit approximately the total amount of memory that uh, a sub or a subtree uses. And um, it actually dumps out a ton of useful metrics, but for most of us, probably it's gonna be um, like this, the swap metrics, RSS, and maybe number of page ins and page outs. Um, it, I mean, you, to understand like probably 80 metrics to come out of there, you need to know the memory management system quite well um, of the kernel. And um, so those are the, the major um, C groups categories and that's, that's what allows you to set limits and um, give good quality of service to some containers like your production containers and um, then you know, relegate uh, the non-paying customers or the developers to have no memory and horrible CPU and no access to disks. Um, and this is really what all this came out of was um, companies like Google who um, wanted to, to run production and development machines and you know, long running batch jobs all next to each other on one machine. And, um, and, and so using, you can use various dimensions and kind of limit how things uh, get packed onto the machine. So uh, the last bit that we'll talk about, and probably the most important bit, is um, just some of the tooling that exists around this. And um, what I'm gonna end up doing is just dropping down into the terminal. So um, yell out if you see typos, because it's irritating for you, and it's irritating for me. So um, I'll start with the first one, uh, which is Docker. Um, Docker. Uh, we got a little look at earlier. Um, but what Docker is, is it's a container management tool. And the f they do a few things differently. So in the, in the last few years, we've had tools like LXC and NSpawn, um, which are really convenient if you have a container already sitting on disk. 
And building a container and getting it on disk is actually fairly high bar. Um, most people don't know the command line flags to debootstrap or whatever the Fedora RPM command line invocation is. Um, and so Docker uh, gives you a few convenient things. And the first is that it has an index where you can just pull down arbitrary um, containers. So if, uh, if I come in here, you see I'm running, is that font okay for everyone? Okay. Uh, I'm running Docker run, uh, some parameters don't matter, and then busybox, and then the actual uh, binary inside the container I want to run. And busybox is actually a, um, a part of a URL that goes off to the internet, index.docker.io. It downloads um, the busybox container if it doesn't exist, and then it starts running it for me. In this case, it's already cached, so I can just um, press enter and I get a shell. Um, and it's, it doesn't feel magical unless you don't have something cached. So um, if I come back in here and then I type in base, what's going to happen is, oh, okay, I don't have the image right now. I should um, go off and pull the image down from the internet. And it does a few other things. Um, so a container uh, is a unit of running processes that are isolated. But also, when you're, when you're doing containers, you need to build the containers up on top of each other. Um, a lot of uh, development shops aren't sophisticated enough to just say, uh, out of our continuous integration process, here pops out a root file system that will run our application perfectly the first time. And so Docker allows you to iteratively build um, these layers of your file system um, and uh, actually go from a base like Ubuntu or Fedora image and um, you know, layer on PHP or MySQL or, or Rails or whatever. And then um, you can layer on you know, the latest code from your, from your CI system. Um, and so it gives you a nice, uh, a nice abstraction for creating these layers uh, iteratively. And so you can interact with it more as a developer versus a system administrator who's you know, just laying down a root file system somewhere. And so um, that went over the internet, downloaded an Ubuntu image, and now it's like on my box and it's running. Um, so it's a very convenient abstraction for using all these tools together. Oops. <coughs> Sorry. Oh. Um, so um, the, next, the next really convenient um, tool is Inspawn. Um, and inspawn uh, comes out of system D and it's a really, really thin wrapper around all of this, um, all the namespace and C group stuff. Uh, it operates very similarly to, um, similarly to Docker, only it doesn't have all the magic around pulling things down and it uses some of the newer APIs a little bit better. Um, so. So if I go in here and then I go to my page, all right, go to this. Okay, uh, I have a little bug in the latest kernel I built. Sorry, you're gonna have to wait for five seconds. Oh, what happened? Oh shoot. Well, anyways, um, I won't try to debug that right now, but. Uh, Needless to say, it works. <laughs> um, uh, another really cool um, tool is called NSEnter. Now, we have these namespaces, and they're all isolated, and that's fantastic. Um, but mm, not all the time will you actually know exactly what's going on inside the container. And unless you're running SSH or something, uh, you're not going to be able to just you know, jump in there um, really quick and get a shell or a terminal and look at the file system, why your application is not running or something. Why is it just exiting? Um, now I'm going to have to bust out strace or something and get really frustrated. Um, instead, NSEnter is a really nice tool that allows you to enter an existing namespace. So I can just say, um, I want to jump into the however the namespaces look for this process ID. <coughs> so, uh, I'm skeptical. Sorry? Yeah, sorry. Um, 
I'm skeptical that that PID is correct, but we'll try it. Ah, hey. Um, so <laughs> NS Enter, um, NS Enter, all those flags are the different namespaces. Um, it's like the process namespace and the networking namespace and the other ones. That, and, um, and then it's saying, jump into the namespace of process 683, which is an in-spawn process that's running on my host, and, um, and run bin shell. And so now I have a shell where I can like debug the things that are running inside of that container. Um, so you see that like init is running and stuff in here because that's, it's an actual, um, because uh, 680, process 682 is an actual like container that's running BusyBox. So I, I just jumped into that namespace. And so you don't actually need to run like SSH or something like you would on a virtual machine or, heaven forbid, use the HVM on, on Zen or something and like get an old TTY or something um, that's virtualized. Instead, you just jump into the processes namespace. Um, super cool. Very convenient. Um, the other major tool is actually just the C group hierarchy. So C group is a virtual, um, is, is an actual virtual file system um, that is usually mounted in sysfs, the C group. Um, it's really not recommended these days to actually manipulate this, this file system anymore. Um, uh, there's lo lots of mailing lists and there's actually talk going on right over there. Uh, if you're interested right now, you should leave the room immediately because you about missed that other talk completely um, about how this file system is not really uh, built for having lots and lots of different processes managing it and updating it and adding and removing processes from C groups. Um, but you, that said, you can go in and um, you can look at the, the statistics and that sort of thing that are coming off the C group. Um, so let's see. Um, for example, I, I can look at the I can look at the um, CPU like, off the scheduler, like the CPU accounting statistics for the, the um, C groups, and. Um, You'll notice here that uh, these C groups are being managed by System D, and they've just introduced a new concept called the slice. And anyways, um, that's the talk that's going on next door. But a slice is essentially a piece of, uh, or uh, a flattened C group hierarchy that System D is managing. So you'll probably be seeing a lot of this sort of stuff in Fedora 20 and 21. Um, yeah. So. Uh, SysFS C group is where all the metrics and all the management of the C groups that we were talking about earlier actually happens. Um, and then, uh, yeah, systemd units. Let's see. Yeah, I'll spend two more minutes and then open up for questions. Systemd units um, have a, a number of tools that allow you to um, easily manage the the C groups and set like arbitrary limits on memory or or disk I/O or whatever. Um, so I have, uh, what can I call it? And one second while I go spelunking. Um, okay, so I have these two things called CPU eater, large and small, and they're, um, they're pretty straightforward things. It's the classic, while well, true, do something and throw away all the work I did. Uh, thing and then um, I set the CPU shares to fifteen hundred on this large CPU eater, um, which means that it gets a, a larger portion of the scheduler's attention. And then on this smaller CPU eater, it gets uh, hundred CPU shares. And so, um, using these two things, when I start these services, <laughs> calling them services is a little much, perhaps. But these two processes that are useful in their own way and special. Um, so if I do sys, uh, top right now, just do top. So you'll see that um, I'm assuming the one that's eating up 60% of my CPU is the one that's given a lot more CPU shares than the one that's eating up 4% of my CPU, and they're doing the exact same while loop. Um, and so you're able to, I mean, that's an illustration of how the C groups work at actually limiting and pulling back the amount of resources an individual process is using on your machine. And the same thing can be done for 
uh, disks to I have a disk eater task and oops um, the disk eater task is just DDing files ironically this doesn't illustrate anything very well because uh, I have a very little room on this virtual machine and B uh, an SSD so the process is exit really fast and I didn't have enough time to write some C code for this so um, the block I/O weight is of a thousand, which means that it get a, gets a lot of, of um, access to disk. And then on the small one, which I guarantee you is slower, but I can't illustrate, so I'm gonna have to take my word for it. Um, the smaller one has a block I/O weight of a hundred, and it, so it goes goes much much slower at writing to disk. And so you can manage that. Um, and the cool thing, the last cool tool is an improved top that is C groups aware. That um, ships with system D um, called CG top and um, right now it's sorted by CPU and so you can see um, it, it uses a C group hierarchy and you can see the uh, number of tasks in the C group and then which ones are taking up the most CPU um, and you can also sort by memory and IO that sort of thing. So all the C groups we talked about, you can sort by them and actually figure out which tasks in the hierarchy are using up more of the resources of the machine. Um, so recap, yes, we made it. We have four minutes, yes. All right, recap. Uh, the containers, uh, containers as they are, are built on namespaces and C groups. Namespaces provide the isolation, it's similar to hypervisors, but it's the kernel that's doing the isolation instead of all this virtual hardware. C groups provide the resource limiting and the accounting. So if you want to draw pretty graphs um, or isolate prod from Devel on the same machine, that's what the C groups mechanism does. And these tools can be mixed together to create useful hybrids like Pantheon has done with their, their application containers for all their PHP stuff. Um, the future's happening on next door, you just missed it, sorry. Um, and that's it. Uh, questions? Oh. Okay. Just hand it over to uh, Brandon to choose the people. Don't embarrass me here. Yes. <laughs> I have a very specific question, so I wonder if we should stay up and discuss that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as far as I understand, with the namespaces and containers, you can uh, take the local uh, users that are defined in possibly possible D file mm -hmm. and through them create multiple different uh, storages for the local users. Yes. But with the centrally managed users, that are resolved from the central directory or directories of different sources. Mm -hmm. There's no way to partition different identity of sources to different namespaces right now. Yeah, I, I believe you're correct. And I yeah. think a, a lot of it has to do with the fact that there's no way of namespacing in the file systems right now. Like you can't say. Two releases ago? Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. But that would be remapping, right, with the central user correlation. Yes, but you can do it. So you have to rewrite Etsy password effectively, right? So no, wait. I think that's not Okay. That would be very interesting to actually implement because. Uh, it it sounds like it's implemented, right? Well. Well, 
here, here, here's the problem that I'm trying to solve. Maybe, maybe. So the problem is I have different identity source central, and I can give them to the box. How I manage different sources for different subsets of the application. How I define which identity sources need to be exposed and remapped to different containers. All right, well, uh, thanks.